I think if I'm D Wade, I'm probably already looking for a place to live in China. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball. Again, I did say uh, in yesterday's show uh, to make sure you are joining up to the Patreon, patreon.com slash redrock underscore b-ball for priority access to that Dynasty League those details will go out soon. There are still some spots available in some of the redraft leagues, which you can find on my Twitter timeline. Today, uh, I am recording this show a little bit in advance as well. So I'm going to be looking at uh, more, more of the Summer League recap stuff that we did on yesterday's show. So, Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. We're going to be covering the next uh, 10, next 10 teams uh, through the NBA uh, for Summer League. Uh, next week, got some pretty exciting shows coming up as well, doing some more redrafty type stuff. And if you didn't hear my announcement a couple of days ago that during the, the season, I am going to be doing at least one Dynasty specific show each week. So make sure you are, uh, that'll be on this regular feed. So downloading it, listening to it just for Dynasty specific stuff as well during the season. Let's look back at some of the uh, Summer League action for the middle group of 10 teams in the NBA. We'll start with the Houston Rockets. A really lo a lot to look at here. You know I was big on DeAnthony Melton. He vaulted into my top 20 in my Dynasty rookie ranks. He was excellent. 16-7, and seven, four assists, three steals, almost a block, two and a half threes, which is probably the most interesting thing. He only shot them at 32%. But the fact that he was so willing to take the three ball and the fact that he's worked on his shot as much as he has throughout his year off is massive. I think that he could overtake Michael Carter-Williams at some point this season as the backup point guard on this team, the fourth guard behind Eric Gordon. And as early as next season, he probably slots into the, definitely into that fourth guard spot, maybe even into the third guard spot. He has got... Uh, pretty clear, I believe, uh, top 100 upside, um, probably even higher to top 80, top 70 type upside. So I really do like him and, and like what he was able to show. Joe Chi, another guy who had really strong translations coming out of China. He played 21 minutes a game and averaged 12 and 6, three blocks on 73% shooting and 1.33s per game as well. If Ryan Anderson is moved on from this team, we already know that Trevor Ariza and Luke Marmute are gone. Two guys who played the four a lot. Ryan Anderson played the four. We're going to have Mallow and PJ Tucker and James Ennis playing the three, four combination this season. But an opportunity for a guy like Joe or for uh, Isaiah Hartenstein will have an opportunity to potentially get some minutes there. And both of those guys translate really well uh, statistically. We've got Hartenstein who averaged 10 and 8 with a steal and 2.3 blocks, a strong rebounder, a shot blocker, gets steals. High efficiency guy, 52 and 77 for a true shooting of 63%. You know, obviously, really strong numbers from both Joe and Hartenstein here in Summer League. And I like both of them as really not being big contributors this year, but guys who could have the potential to have maybe one or two top 100 seasons between them. That's, that, that might be unlikely, um, but, but I, I could see... I could see that happening for at least one year between two of those guys to have a season like that, just from that rebounding, shot blocking, and efficiency standpoint that they both they both can bring. Daniel House also scored well, 17 points per game in 27 minutes, two and a half threes. He showed flashes for Phoenix last season, didn't do much in Washington, but someone to watch um, if they find their way onto an end of a roster for deep leagues. I'm not sure his upside's all that high. RJ Hunter did okay. Denga Dell averaged eight points in 21 minutes. I think Chanana Onwaku struggled. Well, not I think. He did struggle. He's in his third season. I'm not sure he's ever going to be an NBA caliber player. And Trayvon Duval yeah, had a strong first game, struggled after that, but has signed a two-way contract now as well. Not with Houston. I believe he's gone to Milwaukee on a two-way. Um, so that's uh, that's interesting there for him, uh, one and done out of Duke, which is worth stashing in a deep dynasty type format. As I said, RJ Hunter hit two threes. He has uh, struggled, had some moments at times with the Bulls and with the Celtics, but very, very little. And I don't think he's ever going to develop uh, into some starting caliber player, nor nor with Vince Edwards, who uh, who didn't do huge amounts to get me too excited during summer league here for Houston. 
Let's talk uh, about the Indiana Pacers now. A few pretty strong performances from this team as well, mainly from uh, Aaron Holiday, who averaged 14 and a half with five rebounds, almost seven assists and three steals. That put him as the number six overall fantasy player throughout Summer League. Um, only shot 34% and 29% from three, and he came in with the reputation as an excellent three-point shooter, shot over 40% each season in UCLA from deep. Obviously, that transition to the deeper line in the NBA can be a little bit of a challenge. He's going to be behind Tyreek Evans, Victor Oladipo, Corey Joseph, and Darren Collison for this coming season, so not going to have too much of an impact there. And I don't really rate him long-term. I think his defense struggles. I'm not sure how much he's going to be able to translate into an NBA starter. We had uh, Edmund Sumner, who missed pretty much all of last season with a knee injury. He averaged 11, 2, and 3 with 1.3 steals. He's probably you know, tops out at, at best at a Corey Joseph type of player, which is okay, but that's probably Sumner's best case scenario. He didn't do much here to really dissuade me from that. While Elise Johnson, their second round pick, who they've signed for this season, he averaged 12 and 9. Defensively, didn't do much, only a half a steal and 0.2 blocks, which isn't really huge amounts there. And with Thad Young, uh, in the mix, still there as the starting power forward. Kylo Quinn, Miles Turner, DeMontis Sabonis. He's not going to get huge amounts of playing time. Neither is TJ Leaf, who struggled. He averaged a triple 0 0.8, 0 0.8 steals, 0 0.8 blocks, 0 0.8 threes. Is he ahead of Elise Johnson for this season? Probably. But yeah, he's. I don't really see him as ever being an excellent NBA player and definitely not a good fantasy option. I'd be surprised if he ever had a top 200 season in the NBA for his fantasy value. There's a couple of other familiar names there. Henry Sims and CJ Wilcox. We've seen them in the NBA before. They didn't do anything to make me think they'll be back while uh, Ben Moore was a two-way guy for the Pacers last season. He averaged two steals in 19 minutes, but yeah, not really too much. Oh, Alex Poitras is the other guy, sorry. 12-4 and four with a block, with a steal. Had some moments for the Sixers a couple of years ago, but probably is going to be a, a guy you might see on a 10-day 10, 10 contract at the end of the season. Probably not going to be ever an NBA rotation player. Let's look at the Clippers who had quite a few players who were who were interesting, especially my man Shea Gilgis Alexander, who averaged 19, 5, and 4 over two steals, a block, and hit a three per game. You know, he's my eighth ranked dynasty rookie. Um, getting minutes this season might be tough, but I'd like to see him get minutes ahead of uh, Milos Teodosic, ahead of Avery Bradley. Not sure that'll be the case but I think he's got that comfortable top 100 upside for the next couple of seasons. Looked like the best player on the court many times during summer league. Probably was the best point guard player uh, throughout the entire tournament. Looked more comfortable taking shots. Still only hit 25% of his threes after hitting 40% in college, but at least took more of them and looked more comfortable doing it. Gets to the rack whenever he wants. I thought he was very impressive. Sendarius Thornwell averaged 14 and five with three assists, a block and a steal. I love his translation numbers, and he had some moments last season, but it feels like he's going to get lost in the shuffle here with the Clippers with so many guards uh, on this team. He's going to be a seventh or eighth option. Yeah, it's still worth a deep league sort of stash, but uh, unlike that, he's, uh, unlike he's going to be um, a guy that contributes much. Jerome Robinson, their other lottery pick, 14 points, uh, 2.3 triples, which is encouraging on 37%, but he just doesn't do enough else 2.7 rebounds 1.7 assists 0.3 steals and that's what i i believe that's why he's wailed down my dynasty rankings what else is he going to do in these other areas can he be a decent efficiency guy maybe can he do anything else it seems unlikely for him at this point Jawan evans was a guy that i was decently high on coming into the draft and the san vicini really loved him when he came in he he struggled here six three and two one and a half steals um, again, probably going to get lost in the shuffle uh, as a smaller point guard who has struggled a bit. Well, Angel uh, Delgado, a two-way player, big man, averaged six boards in 16 minutes, didn't really block shots at all. I think blocked one shot through his five games and 56% uh, from the field and didn't hit a free throw, missed all 10 of his free throws. A guy that was a little bit surprised he didn't get drafted. I don't really see a huge amount of upside there. David Michino was a second round pick of the Clippers a couple of years ago. Yeah, I don't think he is anywhere close to an NBA caliber player. And Vince Hunter played a little bit for the Grizzlies last season. But again, nothing here that makes me look at Vince Hunter and go, shit, he needs to be on an NBA team coming up. I just don't see that as being the case. Let's look at the Lakers. They got to the uh, Summer League Championship. They lost to the Blazers. Josh Hart played a staggering nine games and averaged 20 points, four rebounds, 
two assists and a steal. I think he's got top 100 potential for this season. It depends on how they utilize him and Kentavious Caldwell Pope. If they ever give Lance Stevenson minutes over Josh Hart, then Luke Walton should be fired on the spot. I don't think that'll be the case. I think Hart has a chance to start, but I don't think that he is going to be playing yeah, 32 minutes. If he starts, he might play 27 or 28, and KCP gets 27 or 28 as well. And that probably limits Hart's upside. I do believe he can be a solid top 120 player for three or four years in a row, but can he ever push higher than that? I have my doubts, but he was clearly too good for Summer League. He showed he can hang in the NBA defensively. He can shoot. He can handle the ball. Super impressed with him last season. Strong rebounding year. Yeah, really good summer league. He's going to be a comfortable rotation guy and does have top uh, top 100 potential. Flaming Mo Wagner. Definitely showed me more than I expected defensively. Two steals and 1.7 blocks per game. Well, well above his college block and steal rates. Shot poorly, 37% from the field and 28% from three. Average 13 and eight. Hit over a three a game, and he's going to have an opportunity. But I think we'll see more Beasley and LeBron at center lineups. There's JaVale, there's Zubats. He's not going to be getting enough minutes to be a top 150 guy this season. He might not ever be a top 100 player, Mo Wagner. Um, we're going to be really paying attention to how the steal and block rates look in the NBA and if he spends any time with the South Bay Lakers as well. Sviatoslav Mikhailuk. He uh, played all 10 games, 24 minutes, and hit 2.63s at 39%. That's clearly where his best uh, his skill is. 15 points as well. But what else can he do? Three and a half boards, 1.7 to 6.6 6 steals. He needs to be able to do more in that area to ever become an excellent fantasy uh, fantasy type of a, of a player. I did bump him up my dynasty rookie ranks quite a bit based on you know, how comfortably he looked and how he looked defensively, but he still needs to be able to do way more than that. And I get the feeling because of the Lakers, because they played so many games, because he shot well in majority of them, he is going to elevate himself up dynasty rookie ranks, probably too high for my liking. We had uh, uh, Alex Caruso on this team. He just does what he does. If he's ever in a spot where he gets minutes, the assists will come. He had five with a steal here. Going to be harder for him to do that on this team, though. Xavier Rattan Mays, I'm not really convinced he is an NBA caliber player. And Isaac Bonga struggled. Two points, one rebound, 0. 0.6 to 6 and assists, and 0. 0.4 steals. He's a long way away from contributing, but I do have faith. It is a total upside play in looking at him, but he definitely wasn't impressive. Malik Newman, who they did have as a two way guy and end up waving, um, he battled some injuries. He did not play well and hasn't been picked up by anybody just at this point. Um, let's go on to the Memphis Grizzlies now and have a look at how uh, how this team looked from a from a summer league perspective. You have to like what you saw from Wayne Selden again, much like Joshy Hart, probably too good for summer league. Twenty one points with three threes, three and a half assists. Now he couldn't stay healthy last season. He had a quad injury, very similar to Kawhi Leonard. Did come back at times. Now there there is going to be an opportunity there in Memphis for him to have that uh, to get some minutes. They do have some other players there. Andy Harrison, they just brought in Garrett Temple. Um, obviously, Mike Conley will be back also. How are they going to distribute that playing time at the shooting guard spot? Kyle Anderson's more of a three. Uh, Dylan Brooks, who played a ton of minutes there last season. Marshawn Brooks, who killed it in that spot. I think you're going to have a Brooks, Brooks, Harrison, Selden um, mishmash of players there, really limiting any of their upside. Marshawn Brooks showed what he could do last season. Yeah, Selden's shown what he can do in the last two summer leagues, but none of them really scream that they're going to be in hand grabbing that starting role and playing 32 minutes per night. And I don't think any of them really have a yeah, significantly high fantasy upside. I like what we saw from Selden handling the ball, but when he plays alongside Gasol, when he plays alongside Kyle Anderson, and of course, when he plays alongside Mike Conley, how often is he going to be touching the ball? The answer is probably not much at all, and he's not going to be generating three and a half assists per game. Even if he plays 28 minutes, he just won't be in that situation to be able to do that. Triple J, Jaron Jackson Jr., Still yet to turn 19. He only played 25 minutes a game. 13 and 7, almost two threes, over three blocks. Efficiency was a problem, and it's probably going to be somewhat of an issue. I think that he starts the season as the starting power forward. We know that the Grizzlies traded away Jarrell Martin to the uh, to the Orlando Magic to get Dakari Johnson back. I think they'll end up getting rid of Dakari Johnson. I think that Jaron Jackson is already a better player than Jermichael Green. And even if he doesn't start over Jermichael, Jaron will be getting at least 25 minutes a night from opening night, backing up at center, 
and either starting or playing at power forward. Um, he is going to have top 25 upside, not this season, uh, long term in the next three to four years, he'll be a top 25 guy, I believe. I think he's got a, a real significant chance to be a top 80, probably even top 70 player for this coming season. I'm massively into Jaron Jackson Jr. And nothing that he showed me in summer league made me uh, doubt my thoughts there. Defensive player of the year upside, offensive ability, hits threes. The ball handling stuff's got to work on, but I think it can come. He has got true superstar potential, and that's why he's my number two rookie in my dynasty ranks. When Javon Carter struggled early on here, um, yeah, did some okay things at times, 10 points, four rebounds, four assists, and a steal. But we wanted him to be a guy pushing two, 2.5 steals based on what he did at West Virginia. There is still Andy Harrison, who's going to be backing up Mike Conley. So maybe Javon moves into that third uh, point guard role. He looked not quite up to it at this point. Still a lot of development to go, but we're a, a few years away from that coming to fruition. I thought Ivan Rubb did okay, 10 and six with 0.6 blocks. Maybe he... Uh, is the backup center on this team along with Jaron Jackson, but I don't think his upside to be a starter is necessarily there. While Kobe Simmons took a lot of shots, averaged 16 points, he's more of a shooting guard than a point guard. I don't think he's an NBA starter. I don't think he's really a, a rotational guy on a solid team. Jonte Davis averaged over a block per game. He's in Sacramento now. I wouldn't be stunned if he doesn't if, if he's not even on an NBA team this season. Uh, a lot of it is just the mentality stuff with Deontay, and he's not he's not quite there uh, at all. And uh, again, nothing really showed us in summer league that he's passed to that. DJ Steffen's one of the best and most explosive dunkers in the league. Just watch him. If he ever gets onto a team, just watch him for the dunks. He averaged 1.3 blocks in his 17 minutes, but he is not an NBA caliber uh, rotation player, which is unfortunate because he is one of the more fun players that uh, that do exist in the uh, in the basketball sphere. Let's go on to the Miami Heat. Duncan Robinson, I thought, was the uh, the pick of their players. Also love that he wears number 62. The Heat guys always have weird numbers. They're always in the 50s and 60s in summer league. I don't know why that is, but hey, if he, if he rocks 62 during the regular season, I'm all here for it. He averaged 12 points with three triples, but very similar to a Svi McKay look from the Lakers. He didn't do anything else. Two and a half rebounds, one and a half assists, half a steal. Shooting excellent, 52 from the field, 55 from three. Of course, we can look at those numbers and say they're unlikely to be able to continue for Duncan Robinson, but he's on a two-way deal with the Heat. We know how well they can develop players. He could be a guy that maybe moves in and replaces the Duke Wayne Ellington at some point in the future as that three-point guy who hits two and a half threes in 22 minutes per game. That's what you should be looking at for someone like Duncan Robinson, not really that high upside. Derek Jones Jr., I'm not a big fan of Derek Jones Jr., but I do have to admit he looks significantly better at Summer League than he had at any point in the future. 18 points, 6 rebounds. The blocks, the steals, they're always there with him because of his athleticism. 1.8 steals and 1 block, but he shot, importantly, 46% from 3 and 55% from the field. They've signed him to a regular contract. He was a two-way guy last year after the Suns waived him in order to convert Mike James, who then cut his ass about two days later. Yeah, Jones, it's going to be hard for him to find those minutes behind Goran Dragic, the iron shoulder. Dion Waiters is going to be back. Justice Winslow there on the wing. Tyler Johnson. I'm sure there's other names that I'm forgetting uh, in the guard positions for the, the Heat. But he did take a step forward. He's still just 21 years of age. He has to be able to shoot. The blocks are going to be there from regard. We know how well that really serves someone like Joshie Richardson in terms of their fantasy value. Can Derek Jones Jr. shoot? That is the big question. If he does, then, then maybe he could sneak a top 150 season at some point. It's probably not going to be this year unless injuries strike in Miami, but someone to watch uh, the de decent performance. Bam Adebayo had 14-9, and nine, handled the ball a bit, played a little bit of point guard. The shot blocks were there. The steals were there. Still behind Kelly Linick, still behind Hassan Whiteside, but I do think that uh, Adebayo, in a couple of years' time, yeah, will, be, uh, will be taking the, the mantle as the top 100 player, uh, or sorry, the starting center here. My... Initial metrics in a system I'm still trying to tweak in terms of a top top ceiling in the next seven years says that Bam could become a top 25 guy, which seems really, really high to me, but it, but it is a potential and the likelihood of him getting there is probably low, but he is a guy that you've got to you know, take your lumps for these first couple of seasons, but I think he takes a big, big step forward. Um, uh, Derek Walton Jr., 
Averaged six assists and two steals, but he's been waived. Hasn't caught on anywhere yet. Rashad Vaughn having an opportunity, but did nothing. And Landry Noko, a guy who put up some good numbers in the G League last season, didn't do huge amounts here. Strong rebounder, six rebounds and 0.7 blocks in 17 minutes. And as I mentioned on the G League show a couple of weeks ago, if he gets that opportunity on a team who is struggling down the stretch, could be worth a worth a, a look in some of those formats. Also, Yante Maten, which I think is the incorrect pronunciation, he averaged 11 and six. Some decent numbers for him. I reckon he is just he's someone to pay at least some level of attention to. Um, again, probably need to learn how to pronounce his name. That would be uh, that would be great if I did that. Let's look at the uh, Milwaukee Bucks now. Um, it wasn't great from uh, their number one draft pick in uh, Dante Divincenzo, who was shit house for the most of this time. Averaged half a point per game in 14 minutes across two games. Did have some injuries. Averaged two steals in that time, which was interesting. I, I don't really believe in DiVincenzo as a fantasy contributor, really at any point in his career. The big story here, though, is Christian Wood, who averaged 20 and 11, 0.8 steals, 2.8 blocks, big numbers, hit threes as well. I do want to, I really want to see Christian Wood getting an extended opportunity in the NBA. Now, whether that, uh, whether that comes at, at any point this career. Uh, we we don't we don't know just uh, just yet, but it was uh, it was interesting to see exactly what he was able to do, putting up some uh, some really really huge uh, numbers uh, during summer league, blocking shots, scoring, rebounding, getting steals. He's got that tremendous fantasy upside, and uh, as of this point, I, I believe he he isn't signed uh, as yet on a team. I don't think he's uh, I don't think the um, uh, the Bucks have brought him in. Still waiting to see exactly where uh, where Christian. Actually, I probably should do a quick check. So, uh, there's something nagging in my head saying that uh, Christian Wood was signed on a two way deal. Oh, maybe it was at the Pelicans that signed him. Hmm. D -d Don't tell me they have him and my man Kendrick Williams. Let's have a look. Um, let's. Where are we? No, I can't. Can't actually see that. See that he is uh, he is there at this point. Trev Trevon Duval went to the box as I mentioned in uh, in yesterday's show. Um, now Christian Wood looks looks to still be uh, available, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, he is someone to definitely watch with what he was able to do during his time in summer league. First round pick from last season, DJ Wilson did average thirteen and six. I don't believe in DJ Wilson. I don't think he's going to be a rotation guy. Ursan Ilyasov has got that backup power forward spot in for this year. I don't have any faith in DJ Wilson. While Sterling Brown, he looked big. Um, needs to really work on his uh, athleticism and conditioning. But average 17 and 6, 2 assists, a steal, 2 threes. I look at him as a Josh Hart sort of a guy for the Bucks. I think he should be playing over Tony Snell this season. Whether he will remains to be seen. There's the Jabari Parker minutes that do need to be taken up, although most of those will go to Ursan Ilyasova. Of course, Brook Lopez is still in the mix there uh, for the Bucks. Um, will Sterling ever be a top-level fantasy guy? Probably not, but I think he can have top 150 seasons, which is valuable in the 16-17 type deeper leagues. Tim Quarterman, eh, I don't think there's much to, to really like with him. Jaquan Lewis was uh, around the Bucks for a little bit last season. Travis Trice is, is pushing up in age at, at 25. Not much to really get too excited about with this Bucks team. The Minnesota Timberwolves, some good performances from their draft picks, which is exactly what you want to see. Keita Bates Diop averaged 15 and 7.5, and 1.6 steals, 1.2 blocks, 1.43s. That's a triple one. Of course, it's Tom Thibodeau, so he's not going to play this season. Gorgie Jang, Taj Gibson, Carl Anthony Towns, these guys are all clearly ahead of him in that front court. But in a couple of years' time, Bates Diop, if he can do what he did at Ohio State, if he can do what he did at Summer League, he's going to be a valuable fantasy guy. But yeah, getting there, it's going to be a hard slog for him to get to that area. And I'm not sure that he's necessarily going to be able to do it. Josh Okogie, also really good defensively. Only 11 and 5, but 2.3 steals and 2 blocks. 30% shooting, 16% from three is obviously shit house, And he's not going to play again this season. We've got Jeff Teague. You've got Andrew Wiggins, Jim Butler, Derek Rose, Tyus Jones. All of these guys are going to be ahead of uh, of Josh Okogie. It's Tom Thibodeau. Unless you've got you know, the number one overall pick in the draft, these guys just aren't going to look. The only thing that I'll say there is he looks like he can play defensively. He looks like he's got... That is defensive skills, and we know that Tom Thibodeau really wants to get around guys who can do that. So maybe he could find a way in if Derek, sorry, when Derek Rose gets hurt slash goes AWOL, 
or sucks, although that won't really impact Thibodeau from playing him, maybe a Koji can, can move into a role there and be able to contribute. Josh Richardson style, steals and blocks in limited minutes. He is an interesting player, no doubt. But of course, it, the shot has to come around. I also liked Emil Jefferson, averaged 13 boards with one and a half blocks. He was one of those G League guys I said to keep an eye on. Just watch to see where he signs. Any opportunity he gets, numbers will come with him. Jared Terrell, uh, Terrell. I don't know what happened to my voice then. Jared Terrell, um, a two-way guy for the Timberwolves this season, averaged nine points with four rebounds. I, I don't really see it with him at all. Not too excited. Well, Josh Gray, who put up some decent numbers last season for the Suns in a late-season call-up, didn't really impress. Nor Charles Cook, who was a two-way guy for the Pelicans last season. But Bates, Giop, Okoji, and uh, Emil Jefferson, the three main guys, put up the three big performances, which is exactly what you want to see. Isaiah Cousins did a little bit, but I don't really think that he is an NBA caliber player. Let's look now at the New Orleans Pelicans. Some really interesting performances, especially starting with Frank Jackson, who only played one game, only played 13 minutes, but had 13 and six in that time with an assist, with a steal. And he has an opportunity to be challenging for that backup point guard role. Lord Alfred Payton will likely be starting. But Jackson, you know, with as well as he played, and with, you know, they invested a high pick in him last season, pick number 31, didn't play at all due, due to a foot issue. I think he does have the ability. If, if Payton struggles again, I think we could see Jackson starting games at this point. Yeah, Ian Clark is still around. But who else are we talking about as as a point guard on this team, it's Peyton. Do they move Drew Holiday there? But who's the two guard that moves in unless they're converting someone like Trayvon Blewett to move into that sort of a role or they sign Garland Green, Gerald Green's brother, who again, not exciting options. Frank Jackson's a very, very interesting player with an opportunity that is definitely staring him in the face here um, for, for this team coming up. Uh, in this season, just because of you know what un uncertainty I guess we've got with how Alfred Payton is going to play. So Frank Jackson is someone to look at with uh, some decent performance, or in that 13 minutes, a decent performance. My man Shek Diallo averaged 20 and nine, a steal, a block. Getting minutes is the tough thing. Julius Randle, Tone Davis, Nikola Mirotic. Can he move into the fourth big role? Emeka Okafor still around. When Diallo gets minutes, he will produce. But it's going to require two injuries, maybe weird moves down the line for that to happen. Maybe he gets traded, but he's someone to always keep an eye on. And I loved what he did here in Summer League. I referenced him already. Trayvon Blewett averaged 18 points and four threes, shot 54% from three, got two assists and 0.8 blocks. He's on a two-way. They need guard help. Keep an eye on him. I don't think he's ever going to be someone who is a, a quality NBA starter by any means. Um, but he is someone who who, uh, who can come in, Jordan Crawford style, have these occasional scoring outbursts. Walt Lemon also did well, 14-4 and 6.5 and with 1.6 steals. He's moved on to the Boston Celtics on a two-way deal, unlikely to get much playing time there unless the injuries really strike them down. But someone who, who showed enough to say you, you can be on an NBA roster, when Garland Green, who I already referenced, he hit a three a game, averaged nine points in 17 minutes and has signed a contract with this team. Tony Carr, their second round pick, struggled. Six points in 24 minutes. Athleticism's a problem. Average three and a half assists. I don't think he's an NBA player though and uh, didn't do anything to change my opinion of him uh, during the summer league action. The last team we're going to be looking at today is the New York Knicks. Two of the bigger performances. Mitchell Robinson averaged 13 and 10 with four blocks. Looked excellent. Looked like he can be a starting center in a couple of years' time. And I think has probably top 50 fantasy upside. Ennis Kant is ahead of him at the moment. Uh, maybe Luke Cornett, Joachim Noah. Uh, maybe Noah Vonley ahead of him as well. But a, a guy that I think in a couple of years' time you're looking at as a top 50 type guy. Smashed everything home defensively. Smashed it home offensively. Pick, pick and roll, dunks, putbacks, all that sort of shit. He is going to be good. The fort, Kevin Knox, blew everyone away with 21 points. High usage, he won't be able to maintain a 33% usage. His lack of assist steals and blocks, I think, limits his overall fantasy upside. Could he be yeah, he, a guy that, again, when you look at his statistical profile, it was very similar to Jason, Tate, Jason Tatum last season. Just average to below average in every category. Can he take the Tatum leap? Probably not. That that's That's pushing it a bit. Is he more, could he be more like a Tobias Harris, which is a fine player? Or, or will he struggle? I don't, look, he, he played well. He was still really inefficient. Uh, I was impressed with him. The Kentucky benefit of the doubt is clearly in play here with Knox. I'm just not as sold as some others are who think he should have been a top three pick in this draft or a top five pick. I am clearly not there. 
but I, I will readily admit he is someone that I could be very much wrong on and he could develop because there are a few things there that make you go, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I can see it. I can see the pedigree. I can see the athleticism. I can see some of these talents, but it needs to come. Assists, steals, blocks, the efficiency, all this stuff needs to rise. He got to the rim when he wanted to. He got fouls. Will that translate to the NBA? I'm not sure that it does. And, and that's a level of concern, but obviously looked really fantastic. And I'll readily admit, I'm probably lower on him than what many others are. Frankie Nilakina, their lottery pick from last season, already an excellent defender, averaged 11 points, five and a half assists and 1.5 steals. He's going to be in a battle apparently with Trey Burke for the starting job. I don't know if Manuel Moutier is in that. He probably shouldn't be. I'd love for them to just say, cool, let's just go with Nilakina, Hardaway, Hazonia, Knox, Canter. Like just that's the starting lineup. I want the Knicks to run. I don't know if they will. I don't think Frank is going to be a standard league player this year. But we saw last year he he have these weird little stretches where he'd get bigger amounts of steals and a lot of assists. And if he's playing 30 a night, the assist steals combination is fantasy relevant on its own, no matter what happens in the other categories. And if you can start banging in threes at a decent rate, then there is some value there. I liked what Alonzo Trier did there, two-way guy. He averaged 17 points in 31 minutes. Could very easily be ahead of someone like Damian Dotson already, who struggled uh, with only eight points in 28 minutes and only 33% from three. Troy Williams has been waived. He did okay. I'm not really sure he's an NBA player. Luke Cornett only played the one game and didn't do much. Uh, Michael Binaget, who was a second-round pick of the Pistons a couple of seasons ago, played a couple of games. I don't think he is going to be rushing to be an NBA player. Well, Daniel Achufu, who played for the Wizards as a two-way guy last season, he did a little bit there, 0.8 blocks in 14 minutes. But again, the upside's not really there. We're looking at Frank and Noxie and Mitch Rob and uh, Alonzo Trier as probably that... Um, that four-man guy, uh, a group of guys who, uh, who impressed us. But yeah, a tons of other guys who have been in the NBA. Williams, Atrufu, Dotson, Isaiah Hicks, Luke Cornett, Justin Harper, and Binage. And of course, Jawan Howard Jr. was also on that team and didn't do very much. That will uh, that will wrap up today's edition of the Summer League Recap. Tomorrow, we'll be going through Oklahoma City all the way through to Washington and also covering any other news that happens to break. Go and subscribe to this podcast and give me a five-star rating. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, and on Spotify. On YouTube, hit subscribe, thumbs up, tell your friends, share it, leave a comment. All that great stuff is a great way of helping the show out as well. New Dynasty League potential, New Dynasty League coming, redraft leagues coming, lots happening. Uh, follow me on Twitter for all that information. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Damien Wilkins.